Okay, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Tihu Milazic, as you could see on the poster, or just Tihi. Tihi means quiet in Serbian. <laughs> so I come originally uh, from Serbia, and uh, currently I work in England. Um, I'm new at Newball College, I'm teaching systematic theology. But parallelly, I also work in Trans-European Division, this is the other European Division of Adventist Church, as a director of student ministry or public campus ministry. I think you call this amicus here, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's my job. And um, traveling around uh, in the last few years uh, in 22 countries that where I have to oversee the work of students, I encounter the same issues. Um, the students are having a slightly different angle to it, but the same phenomena which is spreading everywhere. The young people are actually leaving the church. Not only young people, but people who are also uh, uh, in, in their mature age, they're leaving the church uh, in order to remain Christian. Not to, they're not dropping Christianity, they're not dropping Christ, they're actually passionate about faith and passionate about growing in Christ, yet they feel that church is somehow an obstacle uh, to their faith, unfortunately. So, uh, this is a trend that we're going to address today to see how do we respond to that, uh, to this trend, which is not only within Adventist church, it's, it's interdenominational, it's an in, inter... Um, <coughs> also in continental, in different places, we can see the same trend. And statistics are sometimes overwhelming, like three or four, every three or four students will leave the church. Somehow church uh, is seen as something which is peripheral for Christian identity, not central. So let's start up with a question. I'm, I'm curious how you feel about it. Um, can a person be a true Christian without being part of, a ch of the church? So if you can discuss the, with the person next to you, just briefly, in a minute or two, how would you answer this question? And this is going to be the basis for our later discussion. Again, the question, can a person be a true Christian without being a part of the church? Okay, let's see some of the answers that you had. What do you think? Can you be a Christian, really Christian, without going to the church or without being part of the church as a community? Yeah. Always traditionally understood. What do you think? Yes. Uh, we are, I was saying it depends on how you find church. Exactly. I love, don't like the, the article, the Ah, uh -huh. okay. And I would say a Christian needs a Christian fellowship, uh -huh. but um, not a Christian institution. And this fellowship can take place wherever and whenever. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not dependent on a certain time or a certain date. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can happen all the time. But you need to have such kind of Christian fellowship because uh, the fellowship needs you and you need the fellowship because sometimes we are strong, sometimes we are weak, mm -hmm. and we need to encourage each other. And Jesus came on earth to, to build individuals up for Christ, but to build, to form a Christian community. Okay, let's build on this answer. Uh, is then the church, you know, there's, there's a typical phrase used in theology of church, is the church uh, part of ben esse or just esse of church? Ben esse, the well-being of church, so it's very useful, beneficial, ben esse, you know, beneficial to, to go to a church because you can have different benefits from it, and it's uh, good for your well-being as a Christian. Or is it part of the essence, which is like, there is no way you can be Christian without this community? So that's the question. Uh, building on that definition as a community rather than institution. Yes. What would you say? Things are becoming harder once, once we define the, exactly what the church is, you know. If it's a community, not just, we understand not only an anti-institutional response, but do I need this group of people and to be committed to uh, part of this group? Yes. Well, that's a tough question, but I think I would go to the New Testament, back in the New Testament, to find an answer for this. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, there is no one example for a solo Christian refusing to be part of the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the only one I know is of the example of the Ethiopian, and um, mm -hmm. and this one is just because of the distance from Israel to Ethiopia that mm -hmm. he is not part of a is of a Jerusalem church. Yes, yes. But I think that he's, when he's going back to, to his 
home then. He created a church. I, I, I think he started a new uh -huh. church. Uh -huh. Or at least a worship uh, center or something like that. Interesting, interesting answer. The thing is, this even though it's like a natural for Christians to do group, you know, and for people, somehow those people still find it necessary to leave the, uh, the, the concrete, visible community around them. So this is the church of spirituality. Very weird phenomenon of 21st century. And uh, today we're going to actually see uh, how do we respond to it. So I'm going to give you two handouts. Yeah, yeah, there's another hand. Just a question for me for this course. Yeah. I experience it as well the other way. People who get interested in the Christian faith, they don't want to be part of the denomination or institution. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yes. yes. So this seems to be like a, a multi-layered phenomenon, which, which is whether we act to the institution and denominationalism and thinking that they, uh, there is no point of dividing Christianhood uh, into those smaller units, or reacting to the idea of community itself, why they need it, or, you know, so... Uh, there are variants between them. There are then those who go a step further and become SBNRs, which is spiritual but not religious, you know. And uh, so there are different, different, different types of this phenomena. Now you have you will have two handouts, but I have, I'm afraid to give you now because you will end up reading rather than participating. I'll give you later. Uh, I'm just going to use this one, uh, the Osmers method. Um, Osmer's method is technically a practical method. How do you wrestle with these kind of questions, with these kind of phenomena for the church? And there are four ways. Uh, first, there's this descriptive empirical task. What's going on? Describe the phenomena. What kind of phenomena is this? And then you ask the deeper question, why is it going on? What's, what's the, the drive behind this movement? Why do they leave the church? So this is the interpretative task. Interpretative task, what is going on? Why is it going on? Third one is normative task, as suggested. Um, what ought to be going on? So we're going to back into the Bible to see uh, normative vision. This is what we should supposed to be, but possibly we are not. And finally, there's a pragmatic task, going back to practice. How might we respond? I think this will be a useful framework. And you have a reading list here and his book and the link you can click. And um, also the lecture pre-recorded that you can just watch on YouTube uh, if you want to go deeper in the topic, okay? There'll be also some questions that, that will guide our discussion, practical discussion, how do we respond, especially this pragmatic task. So we're starting with experience, going into theory, full round circle, going back into the experience to see how do we enhance our experience of community and respond, respond to this trend. Does this make sense? So these are four layers that we are do, we're do, we're doing today. And um, this, could, this would be a useful template for you when you deal with any sort of issue, social and ecclesiological in your church, to follow this method. Okay, so first, what's going on? So there are church leavers, and there are different statistics. I, I didn't have my hand on the most current European statistics, because usually Americans are better at that. So I got something from America. There is a Jamie, a, a Jamie Ellis, Ellis, oh sorry, Alan Jamison, he's a sociologist, and he did quantitative study. He technically, uh, he technically sat at the back door of the church where people are leaving the church and focused on them. Why are you leaving? He had uh, these interviews with people. And then five years later, he did the same experiment. What's happening to those people? And he, that now those people are now followed to see what's going on with this trend. And technically, what he discovered is a surprising thing. Um, okay, first, reasons why they're leaving. He outlined the following one. They feel that they are not fitting in. They feel that somehow there are differences in perception of reality and also that they are experiencing spiritual and emotional bullying. I don't know whether you listened to this morning's presentation by Stephen Sieg and he was talking about a daughter who feels like when you come to the church you feel not good enough. Uh, not enough. You don't have what it takes. You feel bullied almost, you know, spiritually and abused. Uh, by certain norms and you're not achieving them and people trying to impose something on you, something that should be private and sacred. And people don't like that and they're leaving the church. They also feel that the environment is irrelevant, that claustrophobic and controlling. And somehow, even if you want to implement some change, you feel powerless. Uh, your decisions and your attempts to reform the church somehow doesn't work. Nothing changes. This kind of continues as a closed continuum. No nothing is interrupted, then they realize there is no true spiritual development. I don't know whether you had ever this experience of um, 
you encountered a person who was there for 50 years, you would expect them to be very mature. Mm -hmm. But try to sit in their place. Mm -hmm. You see the wrath of a, of a, of a lamb uh, uh, coming out. So you, you see how there are different flaws in character, different um, like spiritual basic problems that they did not overcome. Okay, this might be a general problem of human nature, yet you would expect some kind of progress, maturation process to happen, and it did not happen. That means the church didn't do its job, you know. So, boredom. Um, and also they feel that if they had a problem, church did not deal with it uh, always adequately. They did not handle the crisis situation, moral failure, the way it should be, compassionately, in a Christian manner. So, there are multiple reasons why people are leaving. Um, but this is what surprises about uh, Jimison's study. 94% uh, was actually leaders in a church. In our church, our current statistic, I don't know whether you have it here, here for your division, but after 2015, we had a lot of people who were really in leadership dropping uh, their duties and leaving the church. They felt embarrassed of their own church, especially the way women were treated and so on. And uh, they feel like, I don't want to be part of this sect. Of this uh, community, they felt embarrassed and so on, and they're leaving. Middle age, even 70 percent, and more than 15 years, they were already in a church. So this is not the new believers who are shaken quickly and who had a problem. They are apostatizing against Christ. No, these are deeply committed Christians who leave the church because church did not do what it's supposed to do. This is one of the categories that of church leavers that few expected to see in this kind of uh, investigation. Apostle, the most useful analogy that he used to describe this group of people is actually the following. He, he compared them with this um, luxury liner in a mid cruise. So there is uh, this cruise that people are attending, and this cruise is, uh, has a lot of endless buffets and, and entertainment, carefully designed activities, or captain who makes all decisions about the ship's speed and direction, and they got tired of this very sameness, uniformity, Somehow this community was not there for them. They could not really fully participate. Somebody else controls everything. Um, and you need to comply to the schedule that somebody else makes. To use a key term these days, com comply. And uh, so they long to experience what is not an itinerary. They sell all they have to buy a small boat and leave the well-traveled sea lines for uncharted waters. They want more adventure. They want deeper with God. In order to find God, they jump into their boats to save their soul and want to explore the new islands and new depths of their experience with God. So this is a very a paradoxical group, leaving the very institution, the very place where this kind of encounter and adventure Uncharted waters should be explored within, you know. Somehow, maybe in a certain period of um, development, church forgot some of its nature, what's supposed to be. So they have this anti-institutional uh, sentiment. They're protesting against form formalism and uniformity. And they have preference for a low-level co commitment. What we notice, what you notice when you study those people later, they will still try to be part of some community, some organic community, they will then change those community, how it fits them, whether it's beneficial for them or not. They will technically um, maybe visit spiritual concerts or barbecues or socializing events and so on, searching for, for spiritual companions, as you said, for fellowship, yet somehow they're allergic to the idea of church as, you know, an institution. And uh, maybe this is... <coughs> then a challenge for us today. How do we respond to this? Do we ignore it? This is uh, us trying to uh, say that it doesn't exist, not react. Then we're going to technically have this problem in the next 10, 50 years. We're going to lose more and more people. Do we fight against it, labeling them? But they are honest people who want to search for depth in Christ, you know? Escape from it, we can't. Consent to it, maybe that's the way to be Christian. Maybe we should follow the, their lead. Um, but somehow this goes very much against what we know would be a desired form of Christianity. Um, and then, maybe number five, I think, would be the one I would like to take explore today with you. What if we use this crisis to grow? We use this crisis to engage more constructively 
with what it means to be church, to deepen its and strengthen its like multidimensional communal nature, to understand what it is. We, the, whole, the whole week we talk about is I core. That's exactly the response to this sentiment. Um, that, that there is something to be discovered about community, certain qualities that we need to embody, certain dimensions that are maybe missing. Perhaps the answering to this, uh, to this particular trend, the most efficient one is not necessarily creating another set of logical arguments um, to prove that church is the right one. Perhaps the, uh, is actually demonstrating what it means to be church. But in order to really do that, we need to know what we are demonstrating. What is this vision that we all want to capture in our, on our journey? So here I'll just break for a moment and tell you that these are the four aspects of principles that your theory and your response always have to have in order to really be appealing to the people that you want to pursue. This is worldview criteria upon which your worldview and your proposal will be dismissed or accepted. Your theory is more likely to be true if it's coherent. That's a theory of coherence of truth. Uh, that doesn't mean that if your theory is coherent, it is guarantees that it's true because you can have a coherent lie, but there is no true which, con con um, which consists of contradictions and it's less likely to be true, okay? Uh, paradoxes, yes, but it's open contradictions of meaning. Um, we are trying to overcome to have a logical explanation and somehow if this works for the reason and passes a test if it's a solid construct it's more likely to be true but then you go to a second criteria which is correspondence does this um, theory fits your reality okay so this is a test of experience if it works i'll buy it i had friends technically millennials uh, a guy who said i hate christianity and he had the reason for it because the way priests in Serbia treated her, his mother, uh, which is Muslim, and how they forced her to um, baptize and so on when his father, a Muslim, died and so on. So it's, they had a very abusive, bad experience with the Eastern Orthodox Church. He doesn't want to hear anything about God. So when I talk to him about prayer, when I talk to him about God, he says, you know what? Don't tell anything about it. But if it works for you, I buy you. If it works for you, um, that, then I believe it's true. This generation somehow does not depend on this kind of just putting all the rational argument together. If it works in reality and experience, most it's more likely to be true. And I want to be part of that. If it works, if it really is as, is as beneficial as you say. So how, it's almost apologetic, it's twisting. Now our response will not be today to go, I will, I will give you some intellectual basis and theory, yet demonstrating this theory is the most successful way of gaining them back. Uh, or um, converting the church to be something else that it's supposed to be and it's not. Uh, universality, this theory has to stand the test of all the new information and insights coming from science, from new discoveries and so on. And then if it can answer the questions, then it stands. Explanatory power, possibly one of the, the, the most important ones, is if it explains the reality better. So your theory... Let's say if you offer somebody a, a black and white screen, or you offer HD quality, uh, or you offer 4K high resolution monitor, and you ask them which one is the best, they will all go for 4K. You see, that that's somehow portrays your reality in the smallest details, the most accurate that you can get. And black and white something it does, doesn't do that for you. So if your theory, theory can help people to see and explain the world better, they will jump for that, rather. Okay? So this is why what, what's in apologetics. What, we, um, what you want to do for the theory to sound coherent for Adventists and non-Adventists, Christian and non-Christians. I had technically um, the presentation that I will have with you today with religious terms. I had it two weeks ago uh, in um, Switzerland called by non-Adventist group, Muslims, Hindus, all sorts of... <coughs> Uh, religions there. There is no common denominator. I can't use the Christian vocabulary, but we still have a meaningful weekend because the notions and ideas there are somehow deeply appealing to human nature. So you can see that the excitement about a topic. Um, but when they can see that it's coherent, that it's somehow experiential, it, it really makes a difference in your life. Also, it somehow is, um, is universal in general and uh, can you can they try to ask questions and and somehow this vision helps them explain and answer their questions 
and they can see the full resolution of life. So, um, yes? I have a question. Can you repeat what is the, the headline? Uh, world view, I just played with the German one, like you saw double, uh, you know, Volkswagen. I did like a world, Weltanschauung, you know, from, from Kant, Emmanuel. Uh, world view, the lenses through which you see reality. This is always the common criteria that you appeal to when you want to talk be between the worldviews. Uh, the reason why I'm, I, uh, I just added is because yesterday some people asked us, how, how would you do it, how did you prove this to non-Christians that they actually need a community? Present the high resolution story about it. Often in the pudding, there is a proof. Once they've tried the cake, tastes good, makes sense, it's nourishing for the body, they accept the solution. Okay, so let's pack all of those into this, what's going to come. We're going to go back, we're coming to a normative task. Now we're going to go deeper, just to see whether we're all on time. Yes, should be fine for me. Good, we're on time. Um, koinonia. This is the word being, yes. That's a question. How can I work with people who are not attending the church? Uh -huh. If I work with, the, I'm a pastor working with the church, it's not impossible to put a new world view on them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes. Uh, for me, it's... It, is it impossible to change their their mind mind setting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for a, for the, for another view? Mm -hmm. But my my goal group, my 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 group I want to reach, they're not attending the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think this is where we uh, where we need to go out and meet them where they are. So technically, uh, you not necessarily start even with that. You start with living your theory. Until it makes sense for them. Wow, the way he lives makes sense. Uh, and it's somehow good. I want to do the same. Then they come to you and they ask you questions. Mm -hmm. So what happened to me, let me just give you a brief uh, answer to this. Um, I was, you know, uh, Oxford University, where I studied my seven years of my doctorate about the nature of church. Um, and they are very famous for the apologetics. Mm -hmm. They have people like Ravi Zacharias, John Lennox, Alistair McGrath, even William Lane Craig comes from America often to teach. So they were teaching apologetics there and defending Christianity against people who are like neo-atheists, mm -hmm. like Richard Dawkins. You heard about Richard Dawkins. So he was my neighbor, literally, across the way. So, and I, I went into atheist clubs to see what are the type of questions they're asking. They're widely quoting this guy. And uh, so I exposed myself to, to this kind of groups. And Alex, uh, have you been there in Oxford or not? To this group, yeah? Oh, no, 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 not there. Yeah, you're in a different university, yeah. But in UK, that those guys are kind of mm -hmm. uh, constantly fighting, you know? So how do you prove to those atheists, I'm not part of their group, how do you prove their theory? Something that worked for me is happened to be, I think, part of God's providence that he gave me the argument of experience first, so they inquired about theory. Mm -hmm. So they somehow God provided me with the second point, corresponds to reality and, and it has explanatory power. And then they inquire about theory. What happened is, um, we talk about the church, which is kind of a, a body which is united by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit somehow unites those people. It's a kind of mystical organism, you know, or mysterious organism. It goes beyond structure, okay? But how do you prove that? So what happened to me is that uh, I felt the goal calling to go there. I was accepted, and this is already a miracle out of few thousand of application, nine of them are accepted, but they accept with, with the pretext, we want you to provide a clear voice of Adventism on these particular issues on ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. okay. So for me, this was a big thing. I never expected to go further for study. I wanted to be a youth pastor to work in a local church, but the door closed and I didn't have other, other option actually uh, than to inquire about what do I study further. And this closed in such a way that I had a very bad taste about the church because it, I was a part of victim of church politics. You know, They sent me for study. They paid for it so I can work back in my country, in Serbia, for years. When I came back, they just told me, even though I had all the best marks and I was always, uh, my academia is my first nature. You know, like I, I, that's, I'm academic first and then other things. They told me, ah, I don't think that you have intellectual capacity to deal with theology. You rather sing to young people, entertain them, and so on. So for a whole year, I'm knocking on the door, trying to find a job, trying to be in any local church. Even without the church, they said, we don't have place for you. So try now to, de to, talk, to write a doctrine about the church with whom you just had this kind of a relationship, which you, it burned all the bridges in me. You know, like 
I got disappointed. I'm like, I was forever there, always giving to church. Mm -hmm. Like my family, like fifth generation Adventists, you know. So like I breathe Adventism, breathe for church. I do this for ideals, for the church. And then some a church just burns me like that. So I had anger. But now God asked me to write about this church, you know, in my private communication with him. Um, God somehow led me into this path. It's a very big paradox there, but nine months of incredible story that he created and how he opened the door. And here I am, I already unpacked my stuff in a room at Oxford. And we need to start next week. And there's excitement, there's like a new thing starting, you know. And then I got a call from my potential super uh, sponsor from America who said, I'm withdrawing my funds. I said, what? If I don't pay by Friday, I'm out of the system. And he says, sorry, there is a crisis in America, you know, this uh, economic crisis where, the, you know, real estate, he's taking the money back. So here we go. I go to a financial office, uh, and there was a lady, Amanda, she's 80s, by the way, and uh, I talked to her, can you extend the date? I'll try to invite the people, I'll try everything what I can. Sorry, if you can't pay, you're out of the system. So it was very, very strict. And I even then went to a prayer Friday morning, I remember clearly, and I was all upset and anxious. What do I do? And then I remember, I didn't ask to be here. You know, it's, it's God's battle, battle. And the worst, came, worst of the Bible, Second Chronicles uh, verse, uh, chapter 20, came to me when God says, uh, this is not your battle, it's my battle. Stand and watch how I'll fight for you. And then I said, okay, if this was you leading me in the last nine months, then you provide. And I hate those kind of, you know, uh, fideistic, sometimes intellectually even lazy, you know, like a fundamentalist people who say, God will provide, and then they don't, they're lazy and don't do anything. But I really didn't have any other options, you know. So what happens after the prayer, I opened my email. There was 23 emails from 23 countries. Like, there is no way somebody could coordinate this like, activity because those people do not know each other, most of them. Some know me directly, some not. And they write a letter such as this. Uh, Dear Tihomil Azic, <clears throat> our friend told us there is a, an Adventist as well as a Christian, you know, um, going to Oxford and studying theology. We pray to God that he gives us experience this month. We pray that if we earn extra money, more money than what we usually earn, we want to send for some good project and for some initiative and for, to support some student. Uh, would you please give us your bank account, if you don't mind? I said, I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> giving you my bank account. 23 countries, I'm talking about like Russia, America, Beirut, Serbia, Australia, like all sorts of places. And when the money came, it was the exact amount how much I need to pass the first year, 21,200 pounds. Uh, there's no way I can, the whole my family paid together. Uh, there's no way we can collect this money in such a short notice. 21,200 pounds, not 10 pounds more or less. It's the amount I need to pass. And I could not believe I was in tears, you know. And what was beyond my brain was like, who, what kind of cosmic manager has to do to coordinate, not only people sending at the same day, randomly, without me initiating, but people from different countries earning that money to send here. Uh, you know, they're just doing what they agree with, with God to do, you know, if they earn extra coordinating their salaries in so many different cult cultures. There's not one human being who can do that, you know, on a short notice. Uh, and in that, do it with such a precision. Nobody knew how much I owe, 21,200, but it was the exact amount. So I'm walking there, I'm like a dream walking on the street. I went to bank to see that I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Give me the bank accounts, I want to see everything proof, like physical. Um, and. And it, it's there, you know, you can see the pending transactions and everything. And uh, so what's happening is I go to the college, I come to the lady, 80s, and then uh, Amanda, and I put this check in the envelope, which is usually used for cancellations of studies because you can't pay. But I want to play a trick with her, so I do that. <laughs> and, uh, and I made a sad face and I come to her, ah, here we go. Oh, poor thing, don't worry, you're young, there'll be more chance in life for you. And she's like encouraging me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then she opens, like, what? What's this? You know, and then I show her, like, account, I was all happy, you know. <laughs> so tell me the story, what's happened? How did you get this so much money like, in such a short period? Who are those people? I said, I don't know. How, how do you mean you don't know them? Who will just give you, like, that 2,000 pounds, you know? 
you don't know people that this doesn't happen i'm here 20 years in this system you know and this never happened to me you know so she made a drama out of it you know and um and, and this is how first year was paid next year even more complicated story and third year even more like, like, you can't believe whatever i could not earn god sent people who had 10 years or in africa in the middle of africa collecting money on the side because god told them and then coming and I thought, and they asked me, can you receive the money from us? I said, how do I know if money belongs to me? And they said, God gave, gave us this sign. And then they tell me exactly. And these were my private promises to God. And from my diary, if nobody else can read except myself. And I told them, I know who sent you. So what happened is this became a legend in Oxford among the students. And then because they're like, oh, there's a guy. You know, for students, oh, uh, money, money question is always important because nobody has money. <laughs> So there is a guy, which had, and, and then, have, then, then I read the whole story. Atheist Club called me to, to, exp, to explain to them. So here we go with a highly antagonistic team like this in a room here full of people. You need to then tell the story. I tell them, okay, you, I will not give you my interpretation. This is what happens. These are factual things. Um, even there was this uh, recording, uh, Richard Dawkins, if you watch on YouTube, Al Jazeera recorded the dialogue, uh, Oxford Union and debating the Muslim guy. And then after the whole debate, uh, I raised the hand and um, asked him, I like, tr I like truth and I like logic, I like science, but I don't know how within naturalistic worldview to explain this phenomena. Mm -hmm. He simply doesn't give me the answer. So, and then I told him in a minute, this is what happened for the last three years. It's not once, it's coincidence, but cumulative effect of so many different agencies working together how do I explain this without the notion of some transcendent cosmic manager, you know, who moves those people? His answer was so lousy, so inefficient, that they cut out all of the program, but you can still find some versions on YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, he said, okay, within the naturalistic worldview, there is no miracle, so there has to be some explanation. The fact that you are here and uh, means that it's something happened, but how do we explain? I actually don't know. But his answer was so vague, did not fulfill the explanatory power, was not universal, did not, you know, this complete, he lost the argument there. And afterwards, then I had the mass of like people, line of people standing to inquire about it. And how do I explain that? And this is my answer to your question. How do I talk to people outside? Let them see first what God can do in miracle, live the reality. And then they'll ask you for, for, to answer some questions. So uh, it went on a detour, I didn't know. But I think it's a good one to tell you that this koinonia that we are talking about, it it's exists. I spent the last seven years studying about it, and God made it so obvious for me how it exists. And what happened then, I experienced the healing mm -hmm. that I could actually see that God used the church to burn the bridges for me, to close the doors so I can go there where I did not want to go. And I did not have harsh feeling now, even towards those people who told all sorts of things to me, why I'm not adequate for that. And it feels like God used providentially his people to open the doors where I need to be. He supplied uh, the oil everything I need to be. They did their part, and because of that, I, I could do my part. So this is the way to, like, uh, I think, present community, be the community. Let them ask the question. Sorry for the detour. But uh, can you proceed with this one, yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I will refer to this experience. I will use it as a framework now that, that, now that we had a chance to talk about it, you know, so we didn't lose the time. Um, so, koinonia. That's a word that uh, happens in New Testament uh, more than 30, 39 times. But what I did is, instead of now pouring all the information on you, I just selected six different dimensions of this word that you can see implicitly present everywhere where the word appears. Koinonia means this, a very close common ground or connection, like this, a strong, close-knit community which involves the totality of life. This, a strong connection. That's koinonia, or, uh, or um, community, yeah? Fellowship. So these are the dimensions that I discovered. Let me just see how much time I have. Let's, I'll try to do this in uh, 10 minutes, 15. First. It's always theocentric, meaning that God is in the center of this community and it's generated by divine agency, maintained by God and fulfilled by God. So it's more than a social club. You will see this uh, when you read Acts of Epistles. This is the word, the word appears there. 
There was outpouring of the Spirit. There is this manifestation of God's presence. As a result, koinonia comes. Okay. Koinonia was so different than other social groups that, that then the pagans watching at this newly emerging community, <coughs> they had this reaction, which Greek text captures their phobos, and this aphobos, or phobos, which is technically a fear, reverential fear and sense of wonder. Wow. This, this is technically what aphobos, me, uh, aphobos means. Sense of wonder before something which is greater than yourself, greater than what you can explain. It goes beyond your capacity to understand and express it. So this term is also used when the Christ is solved, uh, controlling the sea and, and storm, and he comes down everything, and his disciples are like, wow, Phobos, you know? So this is, some, this is a reality which makes church different than any human construct and so, so, social club. There is God himself present. Now the key question is, if we have the church that allows that God's presence be felt more adequately in a deeper level, would the people really leave the church when they experience in this community that there is a place that is astonishing alignment of God? So God is doing things beyond. We can say, wow, this is something else. Church often becomes all too human. We see politics, we see people who are performing, singing, talking, but we, we fail to see the dimension behind that there is the invisible dimension which, around which this co human community is being centered. So it, uh, if koinonia is a genuine one, it always clusters around this visible, invisible presence of God to the Holy Spirit. Now, question for you. How do we allow space for, for God's presence to be more fully seen in our environment? Do you have some practical suggestions? We can start with more like a narrow context of our gatherings, okay? So what do we do to allow space for God to really be experienced where we are, to become the center of this community? Feel free to, to give some answers. Yes? Well, I think that we should make room for um, the power or um, the tokens God, it, God himself send us uh, testifying of him, for example, his word, Mm -hmm. And I think that it, reading his word on a regular basis mm -hmm. might, uh, can transform your life and, and the life of others too. So if you see transformed life, if you see the power of God's word, that would be one thing to see God's. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly, excellent. The kind of fruit of his presence is that transformed lives, better lives, more warmer people, you know, more loving people, and more, you know, very good, very good. Something else. How do we provide space for that? Is there some practical way we do that? Yes. I can prepare myself by humble myself, uh, and just say, okay, I just give yes. all joy to the Lord and hope that it inspires the other people too. Mm -hmm. I think on my own side. Yes, yes. Yes? Just help the people to encounter God, that they visualize him, that they hear his voice. Uh huh. How do you have people to hear God's voice in our community? It's almost like we need to develop a new culture, a listening culture. To be even free to share these kind of experiences that I just shared with you, you know, to be, to focus, to ask the question, where, what is God up to among us? Ask these questions, you know, what is He up to? Where is He leading us as a community? Interesting, in Newbell College, what they did last Saturday, something amazing. They they had they had this project that they brought the entire church to the gym, around different tables, and they called this event Imagine, and they were advertising that now as a church we are going to create a vision. To, to discover the vision, what God is up to in our community, to how we feel him, how we experience him, how we together want to be a church. So they had different tables and they had key words, like uh, how should we be as a community among ourselves, as commu towards other people outside mission? How do we deal with, how do we improve our worship of God and so on? So they were changing the tables, every group has like 10 minutes, and then gradually they were creating the vision together but just simply by asking the question, what is God up to among us? Or will you create a certain culture of listening? We are here not to make a church, but to discover a church. We are not here just to create something new. No, no. God is up to something to create among us. What is that? In your local church, that might be completely something else compared to other local church. You know? So you have to be completely attuned to that. Uh, but let's go further. And we're going to 
uh, come back to this kind of question after a few more principles. First, it's always a communal. Um, koinonia has this aspect of vertical and horizontal um, uh, community. It's a communal reality, reciprocal and dual directional. Technically, what it means is, um, Apostle John says, whatever we know about the word of God, about Logos, we tell you that you can have koinonia with God and with us. And those two aspects of koinonia are always present in the whole epistle of John and, and wider. Um, the closer you are to divine center, the closer you are to the source of koinonia, God himself, who himself is also a koinonia, a community, the closer you are to another human being. So a text says you can't say that um, you love God, but you don't like others, love others, because then you're a liar. Or you can't say that you love God um, if you don't like the other person also. So it's, this comes together. The closer you are to God, the more you're climbing towards this unity. Now, let me tell you what koinonia is not. Koinonia, koinonia is not if you don't have this part of the triangle. Okay? Because this is individualistic Christianity. You live and exist for yourself with this radar open, turned up towards God. And uh, this is not the fullness of Christian living. Also, koinonia is not this without one side of the triangle. This is mission. Because one person is connected with God and wants other person to, to establish a relationship within which the person can motivate other person to connect with the source. Also, it's not without those two sides. It's communism. To really to have the full reality that... Uh, that God wants us to have as Christians. And Apostle John, he says, this is the point of everything we are preaching to you. This is the point. Koinonia summarizes my life purpose. Even Jesus himself in a prayer, uh, John 17 says, I came here so that I can be one as we are one. You know, so this, this, is a, this is a point of Christianity is koinonia. And if you don't have all those aspects, we can't say that you are in a really full package koinonia. You experience maybe sections of it, fragments, glimpse of what it means to be part of the full community, but you need the fullness of this relationality in order to experience what we are talking about. And this then includes the entire life, principle of holism, multidimensionality. Interestingly, when you trace the word koinonia in New Testament, sometimes koinonia is used simply to describe this, money. The churches said koinonia to the poor church in Jerusalem. Money is koinonia. How can that be? Or koinonia is discovered as koinonia of, of pistis or of faith, koinonia of understanding. We have common understanding, common faith, love towards each other, Holy Spirit. And then it goes on and on to all the practical aspects of our living. So somehow koinonia, if it's a true one, does not happen on the seventh day, and it's as often in our church, seventh-day Adventist church. But during the seven days, okay, uh, 24-7. It's the reality which goes beyond the church. People leave because they're not fully integrated in this multidimensional sharing of life, which has full uh, capacity to support you as an individual, provide the basis for your identity, and it lasts 24-7. It's a support system always available for you, but who would leave that if it really functions outside the walls of this church? Okay? And often we miss what it means. I experienced this when, when the house of my aunt burned in, in 1996. Then we experienced koinonia, but at a very practical base. Um, house burned. Everything what they had, they had two sons, but they managed to get out of the house. Now, uh, there was one miracle happening there. She was a church <laughs> treasurer. Only church money within the wooden uh, wooden... How do you call those? Uh, closet. So everything burned, and the closet, and all this other side, side. And this was on the floor, and money is untouched. Everything else burned, interestingly. And then this, like, the neighbors coming, can, can you believe this would happen, you know? And this is in the village, which most of them is atheists and, you know, communists, ex communists and stuff. And they're like, what, what's happened here? So it attracted the attention. It became the legend in the city. But then, even greater legend is. This is a time in the 90s were very hard for Serbia because of the war and everything. So what happened there is um, members of the church came there every single day. And they were cleaning. Some of them who had money, they had donated some money or some paint and some uh, materials and so on. And they rebuilt the whole house for them from scratch in a few months 
every single day. I remember it was one of the most exciting periods of our church life. Somehow we felt all united. Different gifts, different contributions, yet we were all included in supporting each other. Now imagine a time of crisis where people are fearing for their life and existence. What, what will happen if I lose my job? What will happen if something bad happens? This was the story of Koinonia. Wow, go to Adventist church because they take care of their own. The proof was in the practice. The proof was that by being Koinonia, you already attracted people. Many people came, also for wrong reasons. They came to get benefits, you know. Um, so we have different people profiled being attracted by this. But there was a strong message. We'll do more than just confess the same belief. More than just sharing 28 beliefs. Our lives are intertwined. And this we hold together. It's a holistic connection that happens. Um, it's always interdependent as a community, okay? What is interdependent? All societies, human societies, tend to relate in the, in the three following ways. First, there is dependent societies and structures, which is more authoritarian. Here, there is a dominance of one over many. There is one person or one group of people or more powerful family in the church controlling and making key decisions, and everybody has to fit in that vision. Um, and everybody else is expected to comply to what the overall look, uh, um, vision look like, okay? So here you feel very suppressed individually. You feel like you don't have your own place because community matters more than individuals. So you can't fulfill your, your, your potential and your gifts, and you can't be free as much. On the other side, there is the independent model where everybody just pursues their own dreams. It's almost a form of anarchy, but more egalitarian model where you are here just to benefit your own search for God. And then you feel like, uh, uh, I don't know whether you have this in Germany, silent disco. Yeah. It started in London, actually, 15 years ago, and it spread like a fire everywhere in Europe. You come to disco, you come to the room, which will you know, be a dancing place usually, and then what you, go, what you, you get your own uh, radio emitter and, and, and your, your headphones, you enter the room, you put on the music you like. You know, if it's salsa, if it's something jumpy, if it's something very smooth and, and tango, you dance your own music with a group of people, a bunch of people with, you, with whom you are pressed in this small space. So it's very funny to see them from the outside. It, it feels like they don't have any sense of rhythm, you know. <laughs> but and you enter the room and it's completely silent, no music, you know. This is the good metaphor to describe our church. We dance our own rhythms, our own melodies, but thing which connects us, the music itself and harmony somehow is not present. So this is the model of independency. But when the Holy Spirit works mysteriously, something else happens. I didn't see this in reality as I'm, I'm talking about the idea, of course. Interdependent, meaning that you do your part and you feel like this community helps you to unleash your maximum potential. You are more with this community yourself than without it. At the same time, we are all moving towards the same goal, somehow we are not united. Like the experience that I, that I quoted to you in the beginning, God directed those 23 people to move and do their part. So they didn't, they didn't know, have a clue what it means to me. They did not know that I actually am in problem. They just sent the way that they played their part so that I could do my part at the time. So this was the image of what God does when he controls with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't suppress your personality. Any culture, any church with, that with diversity is suppressed is not fully divinely guided community. It's all too human, all too human. So we have to be careful to be attentive to the diversity and to variety established by the Spirit. If we suppress that and everybody has to do the same thing in the same way, it's most likely not divinely led, you know? So, um, or God, is, God can still use this structure, yet the fullness of what he can do with this church is not there, okay? Let's not be categorical, God is not there. He's trying all of the time. But some structures allow him more space to express the fullness of his wisdom and nature. So, this is like a symphonic orchestra. There is gentle violin, there is a rattling tambourine, there is bombastic tipano, aggressive, you know, trumpets and so on, and, 
And then you wonder how could those such a diverse instruments function together and then comes the conductor and the miracle happens when he starts. They all somehow sound together. This miracle harmony and as well as diversity, unity and diversity is the work, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And natural koinonia in New Testament, when we talk about the body of Christ, that's what we are talking about. Everybody having a meaningful place. Even this small, small piccolo who plays only two bars in a symphonic orchestra. Imagine like playing a piccolo, a small instrument with the high notes, yeah? Um, and you have to now rehearse with this band for like seven months to have your performance. And you're sacrificing so much, hours and hours, just for those two bars. And you can think easily, I have a very small instrument, insignificant, I can skip few rehearsals. But if Pico doesn't play its part in the exact same place where it's assigned, the whole music will lack its combination. Because, you know, when, when it come, the combination comes, there is a build-up, there is, you know, stronger rhythm, there is, like, loud, and then comes this moment of, you know, an explosion of sound, and then Piccolo hits that note, and you feel like you, you get these goosebumps, you know, because, wow, the sound is opening up. And you can't get this effect without Piccolo. So, no, no, no matter how insignificant you think your gift is, it has its irreplaceable place in church. And if you don't play your part, other people will not hear the full harmony. So this is the type of unity we are talking about. Imagine now. Imagine now people outside the world, uh, outside the church, who come and then see how people are thriving within this community. They have their place. And nobody else can replace them. Even their brokenness in the hands of God becomes their biggest strength. You know? Last year we, we spent time with Newball College in Greece doing mission among the homeless on the street. And I, you wouldn't believe what, what you can experience in the middle of Athens, you know, just in a few places there. Like, you're on the street, and people are just freely taking the drugs there, you know, and completely somewhere else, and, you know, and you can't, it can't happen. Like, it, I'm walking down the streets, I'm thinking, this can't, hap this can't be happening, you know. And I had to, like, lead these uh, around 30 youth, and, you know, living in England, we, you get conditioned, you know, they're all about he health and safety, so I'm thinking, what am I doing here? What if they attack my youth here? What do, how do we approach them? So that was a big thing, you know, how to minister to those people. We had sandwiches, of course. We had different things to give them. But what do we then do to establish this care towards people? And you know who is the most successful? Two girls who were raped, who were abused by their parents the entire life from the age four by their father, you know who were uh, drug addicts, who were in a, in, a, in a prison, who literally had damaged past to that degree you won't believe, you know, when they revealed their story to us, to this group last year. And they studied theology. We did not know their past. They were broken. They knew exactly how to deal with those people. You can see those people selling their drugs. They're giving the signs to each other. I would not notice that if she didn't alert me. You see this guy there? He gave the sign to that guy who gave the sign to that guy. So they are... They're monitoring us because they don't want to lose the customers, you know. I did not know, know that. But she knew. She had this mindset. Then she comes to them and she speaks them in a rhythm, repeating, because she knows that they're under the influence. But the way she speaks to them is, I was here where you are. And I was, uh, you know, I didn't, didn't have any hope, but this is where I am today. And then she tells them the story. When she was telling them this story, people, one by one, they could see this light in their eyes. And then we come on the side, we want to help out the witnessing process. So it's, and then we try to talk about Jesus and everything, and he just tells me, uh, he's like all dirty and half aware. He says, not you, not you, her, 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 you know. We, we were powerless there, could not witness to the people. But because they had this brokenness and Christ helped them to overcome it, they were the agents that God could use to speak to those people. You should see the tears, the tears. you should see the Later, we have the messages from those people coming that you brought the faith, uh, hope back into our heart. What do we do? How do we go out of this? So we were connected them with the local church and so on. Uh, anyway, so no matter whether you have a gift or a brokenness, you're indispensable in the process. Oh God. Okay, so how else is this going to be expressed? Except everybody, everybody has their place, meaningful place. You are irre irrepeatable genetic information in the universe. There's nobody like you with the constitution that you have, and you are somehow part of this community. 
uh, expanding. Interestingly, and here we're going to have a discussion, a question later, uh, Koinonia has this uh, dual expansion path. So what does it mean? It grows in inwardly, in mutual love, so we are becoming closer and tighter community, and somehow this overspills and grows outwardly. Like, like in the Book of Acts, many were being baptized, they were coming to this community, so numerically they were growing externally, because they were drawn by what's happening within this community. Uh, uh, Holy Father Ignatius, how they call him, he captured this awe of Gentiles, and uh, who revealed why this Christianity was so successful. Behold how they love each other. It's just amazing to see the, to what extent love goes, how far it goes to minister to people and so on. And uh, this church grew in mutual love and then naturally grew um, in numbers. Now, why is this important? Sometimes church can be like a social club which is interested only in itself. The moment we lose the orientation that we need to grow externally, welcome others, we stop to be koinonia. Uh, organic koinonia. On the other side, if you're a missionary community which is so preoccupied with evangelizing and bringing people to God, where do you bring these two people to? You bring them to a church, you will be embarrassed because you, they will see all sorts of things in church. We are not ready for them. There is no base. There is no community. So both extremes are not called koinonia in New Testament. That's quite a challenge for us. Practical challenge. And finally, we come to the cosmic aspect. Uh, which is technically, church is not only here for us and for the eyes of other people, but it has a wider cosmic role and divine plan, revealed in Ephesians, secret revealed from the beginning to Apostle Paul, Ephesians 3.10. God's purpose in all this, in the creation, was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. Interesting, the church is, he wants to reveal something to the church, his rich variety of wisdom to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So the audience is the cosmic audience. We are here to do something for the entire universe. And the, having this perspective to understand the cosmic role of church, this gives perspective and reason why we come to this community. It's an integral part of God's purpose. He created you to live in community. That's not external to your existence. You are person in relation, by definition. You're born as a part of relationship of your parents and love. You're shaped by other people. You live within relationship as a mode of existence. So my answer to a question, can you be a Christian or without community? You don't experience the fullness of what it means to be a human being without, without community, even less to what it means to be Christian. So it's a necessary part. Now the argument here is that if the church lives this normative vision, if it embodies those values, we appeal to them not only with coherence, with telling consistently the story of the church. We appeal to them because this is a reality which everybody wants to be part of. That's the best way to respond to the churchless trend. Who would want to be churchless in spirituality if you have all the support given to you? So this is the argument of experience which makes sense, logical sense also and um, explain more of who you are as a human being. Uh, you know, I spent some time in Northern America. Um, I took the credit for the, for the university called Wilderness Survival Course in Northern California. You know those forests? You can travel them hours and hours, no civilization. So they dropped us there, like 60 miles from the closest sign of civilization, even further from the city. Uh, eight of us, they drop you in nature. You have only a knife. They tell you when they're going to come back. You have the ex-marine, U.S. Marine, that trains you for the survival. I tell you, this was not a luxury experience. <laughs> it was a tough work to find food and to, to survive there, you know. And how do you make a bed? It's so cold outside. There is nothing to cover yourself with. So you can have to make a fire bed, a fiery bed. How do you control the, fl uh, the smoke not to go into your, your, uh, um, the, the shelter that you are making? How to make those shelters yourself? And... So all sorts of details you need to know to survive uh, long-term in the wilderness. But part of this was actually that um, in the evening when we are all exhausted and this guy really didn't have mercy, I really admire American soldiers, what they do as a training, <laughs> but I'm not that. Uh, and uh, this guy was crazy how much he knew uh, about how to survive and all sorts of tricks he gives you. 
But in the evening, my favorite moment was we actually come to this kind of sort of like a, like a field, huge field, surrounded by these huge trees, you know. We lay next to each other, head to head around, and there is a lady who was with us. She has her own observatory, and she was telling us a story about the stars, you know, all the sorts of legends, but also how do you navigate yourself by looking at the sky? That was part of the training. But this moment of us being there together and watching this beautiful, you know, in you know, such as multi-layered sky, you know, when it, just, it goes very deep. But around us are those forests which are somehow magical for me, like I never saw such as tall trees. And I always lived with conviction that those trees and that those are, they can survive there for 2,000 years, a few hundred meters tall. They can survive the storm because they have very, very deep roots. But then they took my illusions away but they said, no, they actually have very, very shallow roots. How do they stand against the wind and against the storm in a radical situation? Because they have the interlock system of roots. They hold each other. They grow in groups and they hold each other. So when the storm comes, they can withstand because of their interlock system or interlocking system of, system of roots. And I said, wow. This is exactly what God provided us when he said, I, I give you koinonia as a mode of being. That you live together as interlock system of truth, helping each other to reach your full potential, helping each other to withstand the trial and crisis. So community is not essential, like peripheral things in your Christianity, it's essential to existence. It's a better way of being human. So... In order to achieve this, we need to be completely open to God and His guidance, because this, he's, the, he's the factor, He's the agency behind Koinonia and Holy Spirit, to learn how to respond to Him, and then to learn how to love and press together, even though if you're very different, and uh, towards the world, we need to embody the message. So the biggest medicine against church spirituality is embody the church. Martin Luther said, Gospel is like a caged lion. You don't need to defend a caged lion, lion in a cage, yeah? You don't need to defend a caged lion, just release it. Lion is strong enough to fight for himself, you know? <laughs> so, same thing in apologetics. You don't need to defend the church, be the church, unleash the church. That's the strongest argument. It goes beyond every logic. It goes beyond every, every coherent argument. No need to prove further. Be the church. When people like, experience, wow, you're a better person, you thrive. What is the basis for such, such as this interlock system of truth, uh, of, of uh, roots? I have a deep connection with other people and their service to me. They give all in this relationship, this mutual relationship of love, and I give all back, and we are thriving together. Does it make sense? It puts even ICOR in perspective. ICOR is precisely that. Values of this community, you live those, and you don't need to do apologetics against other uh, worldviews demonstrating these works, and this is how you bring them to Jesus. Okay, so uh, I just want to give you the last comment. I was referring all the way to this text. Now see it with the fresh eyes, okay? And here we go. There are three key terms. Logos, which is technically God's self communicating himself. Apostle uh, John summarizes his life mission in this statement. It's very important to understand. Important for our argument too, you'll see why. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, seen, and touched about the word of life, about, about the, the Logos. So this, they experienced the power of God in Logos, we proclaim to you. Why? So that you can also have koinonia with us and with God. We want you to be part of this reality. This is not, church is not only means to an end. It's end itself. Okay? It's both. Okay? We want to bring them to Jesus by demonstrating his love in this community. But this community is the end product. When everything else ends, koinonia stays. Even when Christ comes, our preaching will stop. Our evangelistic, evangelistic crusades will stop. Crusades, I hate the word. Our evangelistic att attempts, but church will remain. Okay? Koinonia prevails. But why do we need that? And here's the key argument for millennials. 
These things we proclaim to you so that your joy may be complete. And the word pleroma is the key one. Fullness. You want fullness of life? Go to koinonia. Fullness. The word used at a time in Mediterranean to describe the process of validation of a trip. So what happens is, uh, before the boat goes and sails, there comes an ins inspector. He has a checklist. And then he examines the boat and everything in it. He says, he has the checklist, says, do we have a competent captain? Yes, check. Do we have enough food for the sailing? Yes. Do we have enough uh, material if something happens to the boat and you need to fix it? Yes, we have, check. Do we have enough crew? Yes, check. Do we have an num uh, adequate number of travelers? Check. When everything is in place, then comes the seal from the inspector saying, Pleroma. Everything needed for the journey is present. So Jesus used the same word when he says, John 10.10, 10, I came here so they can have Pleroma. Everything needed for life. It's hidden here, and I give you. Where is that Pleroma? Jesus went up. Where do we have it? Here's the road revealed. Everything what you need for life is hidden in koinonia. The fullness of life you can get from this community. Okay? And you can be more fully in... Uh, uh, it says, your joy may be, may be pleroma. You, God wants you to be happy, to be fulfilled. So my argument against uh, church spirituality, why would you miss this opportunity to have everything what you need for your Christian journey? It's part of your journey, essential part, it's who you are. It's a mode of existence. It is what it means to be Christian, living as a person in communion. Thank you for the attention. Now we go to the last part. Are we ending at quarter to or to, at six? six? At six, so we have 16 minutes. Now, in order to be the church... Quarter to? Quarter to. Okay. Quarter to. okay. Let's do this. Can you just focus on a few minutes on this one? In your handouts, you have the summary of the literature dealing with Koinonia, recent literature. You will have all the sections of my talk and different principles. So this one gives you the summary that you can actually explore further in your time and go deeper. Also, I attach here the link to the lecture, the hour-long lecture that summarizes only Koinonia, and you can find it on YouTube. I uploaded it a few weeks ago, okay? And if you want to really go deeper, next week you can Google my channel, 24 hours uh, MA level material of how to achieve this. So this is if you have time, 24 hours to listen. But uh, there will be a lot of episodes there if you want to go in depth. This is just a, giving you a glimpse, you know, Church, true to its nature, is a powerful agent here in this world. And no wonder God chooses to communicate his rich variety of, you know, of wisdom to the whole universe. And I think we are sometimes failing to reveal the whole thing to the world, failing to be a church. That's why I really deeply appreciate the effort of your division here for i and values, because you're, you're focusing not on external, not on certain just number of projects to, to look you... To, so you can look successful. You're changing the culture. You're changing the community to really become truer to who you're called to be. Yeah, so if this helps the yeah, I-core mentality in your division and, and whatever, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we had this chance to talk. Now, second hand I, handout gives you some particulars of how you deal with difficult questions uh, and uh, Osman's method and questions for reflections. Those questions, if you follow, um, will help you embody those six principles. So your technical questions are, let me just give you an example. What can we do to maintain the balance between external and internal growth in our community? In other words, how do we want to be trapped or becoming a social club that is not interested in the world around itself? Or becoming a missionary society that suffers from internally poor relationships? Okay. And then there are some more personal questions. How can the brokenness um, and weakness be used by God to empower others to grow spiritually? How do, I, how do I allow the space in our community for brokenness to be heard? Because one of the most powerful ways how God works is actually to the brokenness. He, equip, equipping people. This becomes your spiritual gift, so to say, almost. You know, How do we arri arrive there? So these are practical questions that will help you to 
apply this vision in your lo local church. And I would advise you, if you can do a study in your local church about what it means to be koinonia, there's a video there you can use, and then use this as uh, discussion questions. Yeah? Does it make sense? Good. Any public questions like this, and then we can finish. Is there something that stayed un unresolved? Tension. Do you agree or do you disagree? You feel free to attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, really. That's free. I, I actually enjoy the most a very uh, environment where things are critique and attack because that's how you sharpen your brain, you know? So don't worry about my feelings. You can attack me and say this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Let me defend it if you possible. I'm, I'm wondering how you see this like, play out practically in church because I think mm -hmm. a lot of the things you say, obviously, there are like, things in church that are broken or also like a lot of often like cultural divide and people naturally self-separate, life attracts like, and kind of that interdependence, the kind of interconnectedness is something that I often don't see. So we could be divided culturally, obviously divided our interests or things like this. So yeah. how do you kind of see it play out practically? Because I struggle to, in my own experience, yeah. I'm struggling to see how this might work from what I know about different baggages that people hold. Yes, yes. Um, what I saw is, I never saw one church which embodies all of those. First yeah, disclaimer. Yeah. So I'm talking about ideals. I don't want to create expectations that you can actually go to this kind of church and learn. But some churches are so much better in certain things. I actually learned more from non Adventists. I was visiting a community which is called uh, uh, Jesus Fellowship, whose main project is to embody Koinonia. I was praying for God. God gave me the demonstration for this. Is this just a fiction which creates pain in my soul? Because when I go to my local church at a time when I was studying in Oxford, like, it pains me to see what we are doing in light of the better picture that I'm studying. And then uh, I believe by providence, God took me to the place. People who decided to sell everything they have to have common money even. 600 people in the middle of England actually do that. And these are not Amish people. These are people who are so progressive in their approach. They're the fighters for uh, rights of the marginalized. They go on the street. They take the person from the street and then give them the job. In their job, in their kingdom business is how they call them, they give them equal salaries. The president and CEO and the cleaner have the exact same amount. Of. And then they don't spend this money because anyway, why do we need this money? So they return back into the common purse. One of the most successful businesses in the UK is led by this group. Uh, if, you go, if you go to Waitrose, a like shop, and buy healthy food, produced by them. You know? So I was amazed when I went there. And it was by accident like, that I ended up there. I thought it's a theological conference, and it was their church meeting. But that level of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is amazing. One day, the Spirit tells them, go to a gay, gay club. They go to a gay club and they offer them Holy Communion, like washing of the legs. And the, and the manager of the gay club in Soho Square is in the middle of London. He says, what are you doing? Christian people don't usually go in this part of the town. But when they offer that, there were people who were so touched that Christians, Christians, those who despise us, they are here to show the love of Christ. They got so much interest that they had to open the, the influence, center of influence because people wanted to um, know more about this kind of Jesus. So they're so attentive to the... So what I saw is, in this journey to discover what Quinonia means, God took me to different churches, different groups, which I did not know that they exist. Now I call those groups to... When, we, when I teach this at Newbo, we have a whole master module uh, about this. Um, I call them to, to share their sections in order to learn something uh, from it. So I saw it in smaller groups within the church and sometimes outside even Adventism, you know. So I think have, we, uh, we, we are here, it's like an ongoing process of construction. Uh, and I really look forward to see Newville, I can see now going in a very positive direction in the last few years and people really getting more and more engaged and more people involved. And we can see some trends there. So I could sense the type of quinonia I'm talking about here in theoretically. Yes, any other questions? Okay, yeah, one thing, yeah. I'm going back to this one. You uh -huh. were sharing your impressive story about the study thing. Yes. And that you go to, by the evidence, the supernatural evidence, and then you come to this um, cycle. But what if you don't have a story to share? Mm -hmm. Can you somehow increase the supernaturality in your life? There was a period 
Uh -huh. Can you uh -huh, let me understand the question? The question is in the end, can, what do you do to can increase you the supernaturality? Let the supernatural in your things mm -hmm. happen in your life, so you can share. Them. Yes. What happens? The first three years of Oxford were all like really attention-grabbing years in terms of miracles. You know, this gave, this gave me like a place that they can ask me, and they can, there's a really reliable story of God, and they'll give me the explanation. But I didn't tell you the next four years was the years of complete silence and God not answering uh, prayers. Even to the degree, like say, we were praying for my father who was dying from the cancer, and he died. Um, and even though we had to prove that he was taking care of every situation there, um, he didn't have power, uh, because when he got sick, the entire family, my sister did not have a job at the time, I was a student, my mother didn't have a job. How do you pay for all the surgeries? Always in the last moment, money were coming to some envelope of unknown source. And so we thought this, the few, two years of this kind of miracles led us to believe that God will fulfill our prayer and heal him. In that period of weakness, I have a conviction that God was among us, even though he did not fulfill my prayer. That was the period that I asked this question. So how do I get this back to this miraculous stage so I can experience this healing? And well, that God did that, actually, a very humble and simple act, which maintained my faith in this, uh, possibly the hardest period, period of my life to study. He demonstrated this. How? There was a boy, a, a young man in the church, and who was very... Um, like not present in a, in a public thing in church. So what happened is that he was traveling on a bus and he got this impression that uh, he needs to come out of the bus. He got out and it was already late in the evening, so there is no logic why he would do that. But he followed this prompting inside uh, of, the, of he believed to be Holy Spirit. So what happened is that he had these verses from the Bible suddenly coming to his mind and this psalm and this desire to share it with somebody and he he then asked the question with whom do i share this and there was like my house was nearby he usually didn't visit my house but he calls me can i come and visit you and i'm there he did not what he did not know is that i'm there praying to god god i need you to hear you as if through human being i need to hear your face to see your face i need to hear the words because i can't focus on my studies i was like literally how do you focus when you know that somebody is there dying and you need to now write the arguments for your exam? And so I was stuck for weeks, could not write the articles. So I, I just had this desire to see God's face and to, you know, like get some signs because there's just silence, nothing else. So what happens is when he, when we finish the conversation, I told him, don't come, it's too late. And he says, but I'm already, uh, you know, don't worry, it's going to be short. I said, okay, come. He's entering. He comes to my room. He reads a song, talks exactly to my situation, even that situation with my father. He did not know the background. And then he prays, and when he was praying, I was feeling in this room something that I don't know how to explain, a supernatural presence of God speaking through this human agent to me. Um, and he saw, told me the words, and he just wanted to go, to go home. But what happened is then uh, I stopped him saying, why did you come? I don't know, I just followed this prompting. Uh, that you know, and I had had this desire, desire. I need to share this. And this is the moment when I felt, at the lowest, I felt God being present through Quinonia. He stepped up. He started to believe of the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit gave him the gift that was so adequate there, and, and helped me to go through the hardest periods of life. So in the periods where you don't feel the supernaturality, this could be a, a random event to other people. You know, a nice Christian act of kindness. But when you are in tune with God, when you're constantly searching for His will, you will see how those kindness sometimes beyond, go beyond human. In that person, I saw God that day. I saw Him caring and giving exactly the need I had, everything we needed for the journey. You know? He didn't promise that He will heal my father and do miraculous things that will then be told to all the, you know, the world, but He promised to be there. So sometimes when you don't feel and see the effects of supernaturality, that doesn't mean that God is not there. He's all along there. So the possibly the hardest period and period when you go the deepest in your faith is actually a period where God is not revealing himself. Um, this is actually embrace the silence as a potential for growth of your faith. So that's my answer from the, from the bottom.
from when you, when you didn't see it, you don't feel it. God gives you enough sign to you, you know that you are He's present, but then you need to trust. Yeah. Thank you for coming here and listening. Um, any comments? Anything for the end? Shall we pray? Yeah. Dear God, we are starting Sabbath in your special day. And we want to just thank you for bringing us in this space here that we can study what we are born to be, who we are born to be, person in relation. Now, we realize this is not only apologetic exercise, a rational discourse which, you know, explains all the arguments and faces and solves the problem of this world, but it's life, it's a reality. So help us become what we are supposed to become, the church through which you can witness about your manifold wisdom in front of the whole universe. Help us discover the fullness of this koinonia so we can live it and we can thrive, we can experience the pleroma of joy, everything what we need to thrive. And then other people, when we embody this community, when we really live it, let other people be attracted by it and never desire to go alone, but to stay as a part of your community. In Jesus' name, we ask you for the power and we ask you to give us individually the strength to step up and listen to the prompting of your Holy Spirit and do our part. And so we can together play a beautiful symphony with different instruments. We can experience the miracle called church. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen.